I am a son, a brother, a husband, a father, a grandfather, an uncle, a nephew, and I am a man who has personal commitment to every business that I do. Allow your eyes and your ears to follow us and visualize my journey to entrepreneurship through this documentary. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We are here to talk about my good friend, Ishmael Diaz Jr. Um, I guess I should open and tell you guys how I actually met Ishmael. I met Ishmael, I want to say 2017 or 18, was it? Um, but prior to me meeting um, Ishmael, I was working for this company called, this organization called The Five Ventures, which is an entrepreneurship program that is in prison, right, and post-released. And I was a post-release program manager at the time, I believe. And my partner, my right-hand man, kept telling me about this guy. Yo, this guy Ishmael, he's got, you know, this farm upstate. You know, he's got all these ideas. You know, every other day it was Ishmael this, Ishmael that. And then we had an event. And we used to always be on, because we catered, the program was for, like I said, currently and formerly incarcerated people. And one of the things that we used to stress is like dressing for events. Because sometimes people will show up <clears throat> for a business coaching night or something and not be dressed appropriately. Uh-uh, not Ishmael. Ishmael sh showing up like he's going to, to church or something, right? And then I got to like start engaging Ishmael. And I couldn't get Ishmael off my line. You talking about a nuisance um, when it comes to getting stuff done. <clears throat> and another thing, a consistent thing about him, the brother always got fresh, um, viable ideas, always open to, to assist. And I never um, can recall a time when I, I reached out to Ishmael for assistance, and not just for myself, but for other people, right? And he would step up and volunteer. When it came to showing up, for events, Ishmael was usually the first one in there and one of the last to leave because he talking my ear off about some new idea that he has um, and was always looking to create jobs and opportunities for other people. So I've been on him on the journey with him these last few years for um, the laundry mat, the food truck, um, the hydroponic farm, um, Oh, man, it's just so many. It's a bunch of other ideas. But one thing I admire most about Ishmael is his work ethic um, and his resiliency. Um, I've watched this man get denied time after time, and he just never gives up. So tonight, we're going to honor Ishmael with um, our own stories of how we met Ishmael and the part that he's played in our lives. So does anybody else have anything they'd like to say? Yes, I, I, I believe it was, if the movie, uh, these two movies came out, I believe it was 84. We grew up across the street from Cooper Park in Williamsburg. And uh, he looked out, out for me because, you know, I was a skinny little kid. And uh, he thought I was funny and wild, which I was. And uh, <laughs> he was down the block across the street from me. So he's like, let's go all the way to the south side near the Williamsburg Bridge and the, to the theater. So he always had a boom box with him. He listened to everything. Rock Kim, Run DMC. It was right before Rock Kim was blowing up. So he's like, yo, we're going to go see this double feature. And it's the, he swore he doesn't remember this, but I remember this because he took me and a couple of guys with us, right? And, uh, you know, it was back in the breakdance day. So it was to see Beat Street and Alphabet City, a double feature. And he was going to pay for us to get in everything. I remember about him is that he made sure I went with him. And we got in everything, took care of everybody. And the love he had in his heart, and he still had it. And on the way home, he made sure I, I knew I was going to get in trouble. And I was used to that, taking a whooping when I got home and everything. But he made sure because he... You know, he had to pass my house in front of my building before we got home. And he made sure because I was going to get in trouble. 
especially having two immigrant parents. And he made sure I was all right, especially if they saw me with this, because he's, you know, just a couple of years older than me. And he made sure that I was all right, even though I still got it, but still. And as I got in touch with him, as, you know, Facebook came out many moons later, and he was in a bad position then, uh, we kept in touch. And uh, he still had that in him. He didn't change. He still kept that great character. And uh, and we, we still have that that bond. I run off on a tangent sometimes. It's all good, brother. Thank you for sharing. Let's go, Robert. Let me hear what you got to say about um Ishmael and, and you guys meeting. And how did you meet? And where did you meet? So Ish and I were on the same gallery in a maximum security prison. And... Um, I know it sounds dark every time you mention prison, but in the right context, you got to understand that like the people and their locations is kind of like the block, right? So like I had to pass Ish's cell to get to my cell. And I was always happy to pass Ish's cell because it always smelled good. It smelled like home cooking. <laughs> and <laughs> even on the inside, um, it's very difficult to me to separate Ish's character from his entrepreneurship. I think in, in many cases they're paired together because inside he would always provide both like food for people, but really good memories of home cooked food with using very limited resources on the inside. But he would also do it in such a way that you didn't feel like you were haggling or being hustled or being scammed or something like that. It was like a give and take. And so I always remembered him being somebody I could trust and rely on and who provided that, that warm sense of, of home and care. And I think when I think of him now in terms of business, because I've been watching him as well, like, uh, I see the same things that warmth and care are always at the heart of the things that he's doing. I remember the first thing I heard from him on the outside was right up my alley. I'm really into regenerative agriculture and greening the hood and all that stuff. And he was like, yo, I got a spot. I'm doing hydroponics. I'm like, it's all good. I was like, oh, this is great. You're going to change the world. And just like, but at the heart of it was like, I want to have food available for people. And like, so it, in no way was it different from the dude I knew behind the walls. I didn't really plan to speak, so I don't have nothing that, you know, um, giant to say. But um, I also remember him welcoming me to his establishment, seeing him get it off the ground. And like, I, I don't have as many roots in the neighborhood and places as I did before being in prison. And I, I felt that same home feeling when I walked into the place where he worked, he made a table for me and my wife, we sat in the back, he like gave us hand service. I was like, this is too much. This is crazy. But again, I don't know how you separate the business from the hospitality and the care and the, and the warmth. And so I think for me, that's the number one thing that I remember now and will always remember about Ish is that he's somebody who made me and my family feel comfortable and safe, even in the harshest of places. And um, I think sometimes I feel bad because I, I had a long career in business before prison and like did all kinds of stuff and I failed a lot in life. So I'm always willing to point out the risks in any new idea. And so Ish will call me and be like, hey, Robbie, what do you think about 3D printed houses on Long Island? And I'm like, ah, uh, you know, there's there's risks, <laughs> uh, but it's a great idea, you know, so do it, you know, and um. One thing, and the other thing I appreciate about him specifically with that is that I never felt bad for giving my opinion. And uh, 
I, I can't say that for a lot of people. A lot of people take it really, really personal when you don't jump on the bandwagon and you're not yes, yes, yes the whole time. But Ish somehow helped me be a better me. I could I could speak honestly. I could be straightforward. I could support him even in, in whatever idea it was because I knew he was listening to me. You know what I mean? And that... I think it goes a long way. All right. I, that's probably my time, but I, I really love this guy a lot, a lot. I, I, just my heart. That's beautiful. Glad to hear that, man. Those are some of the same things too here. Everything you said, he's exemplified in the short five, six years I've known him as well. Leah. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I haven't known Ish for very long, but from listening to his story at the TPW meeting, I was very impressed and I work in prisons. So immediately just thought, I want you to get into the facilities and share the story. And so we made a plan to talk on the phone, a zoom call. And somehow when I sent the link, it didn't go through. So he had followed up and like with me a few days before the meeting, he just said like, Hey, I didn't get the link. Can you resend it? Which already was like, all right, cool. Like you're on top of this. You're ready for this meeting. Like, so we get on the call and my man's driving to work. It's like a Saturday or a Sunday. He's like, no, I'm good. I'm like, all right, eyes on the road. We can talk. Um, but it was like, he had to go into the laundromat. It was like a last minute thing. And then, it, but didn't make him late one minute for that meeting with me. Um, and then it was awesome. We, we could talked and I get the feeling from Ish that he's like, this is what I'm doing. These are the projects I'm working on. So you want to help, you want to be in on this or do you, do you not, but it, but I'm going to do it whether you're involved or not. So you cool. And he's just, it was awesome. I was like, wow, there's, it's not often that you meet people like that. Um, and then by the end of the conversation, he's telling me these other people that he knows and he's connected to. And I'm like, wow. He's like, oh yeah, let me know if you want to connect to X, Y, and Z. I'm thinking, oh snap. Like I needed to talk to you. Like you're helping me. Like I was reaching out to you to say like, Hey, can I help? And here he's the one that's serving, you know, and helping me to, to do my work. So it was just very organic. And although I don't I haven't known you for very long ish, it's an honor to know you. And I'm stoked. And I, when I saw this email, I was like, man, you fucking make moves. You're like, I didn't get my like editing person. So we're just going to do a Zoom call and record it. I was like, it's genius. Like, you're not, whole, you're not, nothing's stopping you. It's like a joke. Any obstacle is in your path. It just feels like you're literally playing a game. And it's just a matter of figuring out what steps are necessary and how to find the way to resolve the problem. And it's super inspiring. Um, so thank you. Thank you for letting me be here and yeah, rock on. Right on. So, so Ish, can you tell us, help us to understand where did this um, entrepreneurship like spirit come from? Um, entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I would come home and I see my dad like working overnight every night overtime and hard and sleep tired and then um i spent my 16 16 year old summer i went to uh i saw a little ad in the paper i wanted to everybody's getting summer jobs so i said oh this is a summer job i got found a little packing company in greenpoint brooklyn and i went over there and i had like the little mustache already and back then they didn't ask for no ID. So I went to get the job and it was like, oh, it's for a high load driver. So I was like, oh, I know how to park a car. I was like, okay, I'll take it. So, <laughs> so I sat in the high load while they were talking. I figured out the controls and I was a high load driver in the warehouse. And um, it had two sides. So they had like the packing side that you never really see and the, the, where, the loading and unloading side. And then one day there was nothing for me to do. So they said, oh, you can go to the other side. And so when I went to the other side at the end of the day, one of my friends was outside. So when my friend was outside, he was picking up his mother from the same job. So at 16 years old, I was making the same paycheck that she was making as an adult. So I just said, I, I, why am I gonna go back to school? I said, I can make money doing anything. And that was the beginning of working. Um, and then I saw my father in New York City started their recycle program. So I am actually in my 20s, I'm the one who developed the whole system of how to recycle, how to sort recycled garbage. So everything that they do throughout the United States sorting the garbage, I'm the guy who made that system. 
I just don't get no credit for it. But I had videos before, but I don't, it was VHS and I don't have it. But I was, I actually went against the company. Like they were supposed to be tested during the day. And one day my guys ran out of work and I said, I'm not sending them home. Last time I sent them home early at one o'clock in the morning, somebody got robbed. I said, I'm not sending my guys home early again. So I went down to the floor and I cut all the locks off of the, the a, experimental equipment. And throughout the night, I figured out the whole system. When they came in the morning, I told them, this is how you got to do it. And then they ha I helped design where they were going to put all the new machines. So that's pretty much where my, my start. <laughs> OK, so now we all know what um, entrepreneurship, right? There are many obstacles, right? And I've actually watched you navigate a few of them. Um, can you share with us like your philosophy around problem solving um, when it comes to like obstacles in business? So like now they define it, they say like I'm, I'm like an industrial sociologist. So now that I have the, the, the education, so I, I'm like a problem solver. So I come in, I see the problem and I see how to do it faster, how to do it easier and how to um, to make it more efficient. My, most of my ideas are like outside the box. And that was why I created the Ideas Corporation, Terrell. If you remember when I did the, the presentation in front of the, it was pre-COVID, I did a whole presentation in front of the JP Morgan executives, which it would have went somewhere if it wasn't for COVID. But um, aquaponics is, um, I mean, I made the Ideas Corporation because I, I matched it to ideas so i put my whole name is ideas i added the z so it said id ideas and i said uh the ideas corporation capitalizes on ideas outside the box and that was what i came up with all right it's still continuing with that theme right in terms of entrepreneurship and adversity right um one thing that i do admire about you is your persistence through adversity um can't you can you speak a little bit to like your motivations around that and how it connects to like how you view business and how you operate in business? Uh, well, for me, I'm like a, a all in, you know, like if I got to sell my sneakers to, to get the money to start my business, how I'm wearing slippers, you know? So, you know, most people won't do that. Um, but it's just because in my brain, I know it's going to work. If I can't get it to work, I'm going to figure out how to make it work. And the most problems that happen is when there's too many people putting obstacles. Like when you have your own stuff, it's different. But when you have a lot of people that you need to put it together, it's hard for me to find some, a group of people that are going to think like me. Like a lot of people, they'll want it like all on paper. You know, like there's certain things that you can get from a book. But like the stuff that I do, you can't learn from a book. You know, I, I, I've done, I've worked it. I've been there. I mean, I have pay stubs to show. I've worked jobs 90 hours a week for years. You know, I used to sleep four hours a day. I have pay stubs. Like nobody could ever tell me they work harder than me. <laughs> just, I'm just different. I, when I say I want to do something, I'm, I'm, I'm all in right to the wall. You know, if it's a brick wall, I figure out how to go through it or around it or over it, under it. And I just want to get it done. Okay. Um, let's go to the education question. Can you talk a little bit about like your formal and informal education and the role it played in your success? So before, um, just by working and, and continuing to um, work hard, uh, I was able to earn six figures before I was incarcerated. And that was without a GED. Remember, I dropped out of school when I was 16. So when I was incarcerated, I had to make a decision because I said, uh, am I going to stay here or am I going to, do I want to go home? And um, I said, I'm going to try to go to get my GED. I didn't even know Sing Sing had college. And then um, when I passed my GED, I had a score of 3,000. So my, my reading was, was 800, was maxed out. So when I got the 3,000 on my GED, the late Miss Muhammad, they let me take the entrance exam. And that's how I got into Hudson Link Mercy College without any college credits. 
they gave me my GED score as my um, qualification for taking the entrance exam. Uh, I did Mercy College, uh, just graduated now in December with my bachelor's in behavioral science. I uh, actually have two uh, honor societies, one for uh, uh, behavioral science and one for psychology. So they just uh, inducted me into two organizations for um, honor society. And hopefully in August, I will be attending Columbia for my master's in construction administration. Nice. Nice. I'm proud of you, man. Thank you for all you do. Ram, you had something to um you wanted to add about his entrepreneurial heart? I did. I did because I think it's being lost a little bit. And um, so I met this man in 1987. Well, I'll say 1987. And since then, he's been my protector, my companion, my husband, my backup. So um through it all, you know, through, we, we've lived a prosperous life with adventures up and downs and through the incarceration, even though many years were lost, um, he was still positive, resilient. This man's hustle and ability to take risks are unmeasurable. We started off with buying a house in Long Island. We were not even 25 years old. He, what he said is that he, he quit, got a job at the laundry, going back and forth to the laundry was about an hour and a half commute. He would pick up magazines of real estate out in the Hamptons. So he came home one day with a magazine of this mini mansion. It was 10 bedrooms. This is where it started. This mansion was 10 bedrooms. And at that time, that house was, I think about 650. I looked at it and I was like, you're insane. He says, we're buying this house. I said, I, I don't even wanna talk about it. You're crazy, we're not doing that. What the hell, we need 10 bedrooms. W what are we doing here? He says, let's go, let's go to the open house. I wanna check it out, let's go. We go to the open house, it's a 10 bedroom house. He says, we're buying it. All right, so I just, you know, supportive, the supportive wife I said, okay, so, the house came with an awesome deal. The house came with a contract to for a, a, it was a shelter where they took um, women that were in abusive relationships and um, put them in the house so that who, who's going to look for for a woman you know in in a, that's being this who's going to chase this woman to the Hamptons? Right? So they would put these, these women that were assaulted into these mini mansions that were in the Hamptons where they were safe. And that's the contract that we had. We had a contract with this non for profit. They would pay the mortgage. And I, we had, I don't, I don't know how many people living there, many people living, many women, women and children living there. And um, that's how it basically got started with his entrepreneurship. From there, from then, he would go to that house and be like a mentor to the children that were there. So not only were these people we, we provided, we, we had this mortgage, they were basically, we were contracted for them to pay the mortgage, but he would also go there and be a big brother to the children that were broken there. So then after doing that, we rented. We, we, we were renting a house. We kind of honored this contract and we went to rent a house. He would go there, I don't know, honey, how many days, but it was like maybe once a week or something and be and play basketball, be a big brother. He was just a huge heart. Then he decided this opportunity came across where there was this nightclub for sale. He said, we're going to buy it. I was like, no, nah, you're crazy. Again, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. We're not doing that. That's too dangerous. Da, da, da. No. So he says, yes, we are. I said, where are we going to do? How are we going to do this? Where are we going to get this money to do this? He says, well, we have this house that's paying itself. Who's thinking that, you know? 
we were we were like 28 years old at that point not even who's thinking that and I was like oh my god I was like no no you're not going to take the equity out of the house no you're not going to do that he was like yes we're doing that so we bought this club I supported him I didn't want to I didn't want this club but I was like okay the minute that things get dangerous we're out he said yes I promise the minute that things get dangerous we will be out well, you know, things happen, we can control. And um, fast forward to now, um, he's still trying. Um, we had a successful business until what happened at the club, you know, and um, now we're trying to start again. And he's launched so many things like his empanadas, the laundry, he's got a great contract with the laundry business and uh, he's an awesome cook. We have multiple businesses now. We're trying to start this construction business and we're all in support of you because he has the tenacity and the heart to make it happen. Okay, so that's, I wanted to share that's that. Um, anybody else closing remarks? Well, I've, I've had the privilege and honor to know this man for so many years um, and then just see um, he is a provider, he's a friend, um, a confidant, and uh, someone that you are glad to say that they're on your side. Uh, if there's anything you need, he is someone that will be there. He's been there through some of my happiest moments, and he's been there through some of my most difficult moments. But as you give him his flowers, you have to also acknowledge the woman behind the man. My name is Apostle Eddie Collins, pastor and founder of the Way of Life Gospel Center here in Brooklyn, New York. This is in reference to Ishmael Diaz Jr., a young man who I met about 25 years ago through the late Raymond Winfrey, who was then my administrator of our church. And a um, young man who was very energetic, ambitious, full of life, um, just a fun person to be around. Uh, as, of course, when he was younger, he had a whole lot of energy, but it seemed like he hadn't lost that energy yet. He still got that energy going. Um, he, he, came, he used to come to the church at times. There's times he will come down to the church, and I, I met his family, his family, wonderful family. Uh, a young man who's going places, he had always had an a, a idea of what he wanted to do in life. He was very ambitious and always thought about business or doing something constructive in business. And he's doing what he always wanted to do since he asked from a young man. And I'm glad and I'm proud of him. I want you to know that I'm proud of you, Ishmael. Continue doing what you're doing. And I pray that God would continue to bless you in your, all of your endeavors. And just keep the faith. Keep looking up because God is always there working with you. And everyone else, God bless you. My name is Rodini Almanasi. And... Uh, I was asked by Ishmael to uh, give a history of our friendship or relationship. I met Ishmael over 10 years ago. Um, oh, first, let me tell you what I do. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I do graphic designs and I offer printing services. When I first met Ishmael, he was the owner of a nightclub called Intrigue. Um, he contracted me to do his flyers and his uh, event promotions. So basically what I would do is I would, he would give me the theme of the night or whatever, and I would design the flyers, um, send it to print, go pick it up and bring it out to him. He was one of the guys who helped establish my business and um, help people know me like he helped promote me and get me out there uh ishmael was uh very fair uh respected and um what can i say 
good businessman. He was a good businessman, a good dude. Always liked him, always respected him. He, he took care of me. Um, and vice versa, I took care of him when it came to the graphics and marketing. Um, he had a very nice night. His club, his club was the hottest Latin nightclub on Long Island. He came out of nowhere and he like really took over the scene. It was dope. Um, unfortunately, because he was one of the guys on top, people were always coming to his spot, trying to steal his, uh, what should I say? Steal his ideas. Um, they say the best form of flattery is imitation. So, yeah, they were basically copying all his stuff. It was cool. Anyway, one night, um, somebody, one of the, the unsavory people in the neighborhood, stepped to Ish, uh, pulled a weapon on him. And Ish was forced to defend himself, and he went away for a while. Um, when he came back, um, he told me he was going to start doing stuff. He was always an entrepreneur, always trying to do... He was his own man, so he was trying to, you know, create new ideas and new, new stuff. And I, as always, I'm always there to support him because, like I said, he supported me in the beginning when I first started and help me get my beginning, you know, help me get my start in this graphic design business and help promote me. Um, so when he asked me to do this video, I was more than happy to support. And uh, here I am. So I'm currently a manager at Sherman Williams Paint Store, one of the largest paint stores in the world. Um, I'm working in the Deer Park store. I reached out to Ish because he was doing uh, his entrepreneurial stuff. So, you know, I got with him and um, started, got him to open an account with my store. We, we you know, we reconnected and now he's uh, doing his construction and uh, re realty flip stuff. And I supply him paint for that. And I still do graphics for him on the side and that's it. Make a long story short, Ish can't stop, won't stop. He's always gonna keep on trying to do do the right thing and try to win. And I'm glad to be part of that journey with him. And one day we are gonna make it together. Uh, congratulations on all your success, Ish. I'm proud of you for coming from where you did and and dealing with all the adversity and still being here now and looking forward to much more. Once again, my name is Rodini Armanasi. My company is Maximum Marketing Enterprises. Real quick, I'm gonna do this for my brother Ishmael Diaz, also known as Ish. You heard if you guys make a show, you need to call it Ish. My name is Rich Valentino at King of Long Island. I am a guest analyst for TMZ. I have my own show on World Star called Culture Shock, as well as a successful nightclub and concert promoter, um, artist, you name it. I've been around doing this shit fucking forever. When I was young, I met this gentleman called Ishmael Diaz. He was the owner of a club called Intrigue. Uh, and after he had owned that club, a lot of crazy things happened to him. His story has murder in it. It has uh, a suspected arson. It has old multiple homicides, a lot of crazy shit that happened within this guy's story. He's a Long Island legend. You guys need to give him a, an opportunity to tell his story. And I will be there as well to help him tell his story. You heard? Shout to Ishmael Diaz, uh, a.k.a. Ish. Uh, a now a gentleman. He was not a gentleman before. He was a fucking gangster. Now he's a gentleman, a reformed, reform, dope dude, and a person I consider a friend. God bless Ish. I hope everything works out. Good evening, my name is Kiki Dunstan and I am the Community Engagement Manager for Hudson Link for Higher Education in Prison. And I'm here to tell you about the first time I met Ishmael. I met him in Flush and Meadow Park. I was hosting one of our bi-monthly alumni gatherings. 
and he came through and I was so delighted to meet him for the first time because previously he wasn't able to attend due to scheduling conflicts. So when I first met him, he was uh, telling me about his business adventures. And at that time, he was doing dollar foods, which was selling like everything for a dollar out in Long Island. And I just was like, man, this guy is a man to know. And he always told me to look out for other projects that he had in the works, uh, whether it was stuff with construction on houses or uh, a laundry service and connecting other alumni with employment opportunities. So I was like, man, it was such a pleasure meeting him to I was like, okay, we definitely have to work on some collaborative projects together. And we wind up going to Albany for Clean Slate Advocacy Day. And he was one of our ambassadors for the Clean Slate Rally which we were so proud of him. And he basically just made it his own. And now he has so many different speaking engagements in regards to Clean Slate. And I am just so proud to uh, know him and to be proud that he is one of our alumni who is making an impact and making a difference in folks' lives. So I would just love to send any congratulatory um, wishes to Ishmael because he's definitely the man to know. I want to thank everybody for, for showing up. I think that alone speaks to um, Ishmael's character. Um, we had people, two people here that just met this dude like yesterday, right? Like, and gave an hour of their time this late at night, right? So I think that and um, just I'm looking forward and to, to seeing what else you do, what you do next. And also it feels really good to, again, to give you your flowers while you're here. A lot of people don't, don't get this. And the majority of people out there can't get 10, 15 people um, on a call at one time to say anything or listen to anything they got to say. So I definitely want to salute you on that, brother. And I, I want to ask you um, if you have any closing remarks for us. So just so everybody who's on this call, um, the construction company, I, I saw it. I actually decided to, to do this because my friend who actually owns this laundromat where I have my laundry contract now, uh, was, is, was building a house in Florida. And as he was building the house, he video checks. I wanted to see what he was doing. And as he's video chatting me, I, I just stopped listening to him because he was talking to me, but behind him. I saw like 30 people walking back and forth with cinder blocks and, and just, it was uh, too many people. So I was like, yo, what are you doing? And he was like, that's how you build a house. And I said, that, that's, that's too much stuff, like too much money. And I started doing research, how to build a house easy. <laughs> and I found 3D printing that it was out since 2018. And then I started doing all the research and I said, hey, listen, this is, this is what's coming. Then somebody was doing it in Long Island. I said, it's here. I said, we could get the machine, but he has his money invested in other things. And, um, and I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. You know, I, we purchased a house in August um, with enough property that I wanted to split it to build the house, but it's not, we're not able to split it, but we are able to build a tiny house, which will be our proof of concept and we won't have to pay for extra land just for permits. But uh, we, we're gonna get this machine. One way or the other, that machine gonna be here. And that's, that's where we going. Uh, my logo on the back, our logo is RDI, which is Romy, Demi and Ish, which is my wife's name, my daughter's name and mine. And the name of the corporation is called Real Estate Dreams Envisioned with an I because I just do things outside the box. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's where we're going. We, we're gonna, we, we, I'm trying to make this construction company go public within five years so I can just sit back and collect dividends. That is the name of the game, my brother. Maybe you should even rethink this, man. It sounds like you need to be talking to a writer and somebody needs to write this story, bro.